So uh, one of the drawbacks to SEC Media Days is a lot of our friends are there, but we don't get to spend a ton of time with them. Marty and Ryan McGee were in their suite. We were in our suite. They were separated. We barely even got to see Marty until Terry Black's barbecue. Mm, mm, mm. How good was that? Lived up to the height. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Always nice to fellowship with you. Uh, Terry Black's was just tremendous. What I did not expect, and I'm sure Dunaway has – uh, detailed, uh, chronicled with great detail, his beef rib experience. I uh, I took producer Randy with me. Randy was the uh, Marty and McGee producer for years. He is now the lead producer for SEC Nation. He upgraded. He got a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> he now works with Laura Rutledge and Tim Tebow and Jordan Rogers and Roman Harper and not McGee and me. <laughs> so I took I took Josh Maxson. Yep. The great the great uh Alabama administrator. I'll give him that title. I could I could give him many other titles. <laughs> and I took producer Randy. Well, I told the boys I would buy. What I did not expect was for <laughs> producer Randy to be coaxed into the pound and a half beef rib. Yep. Which as I'm watching the tally on the screen escalate with each passing beep of cold beer, coleslaw, macaroni and cheese, beef rib. It goes from like 3250 3860 152 dollars. Yep. <laughs> Randy's rib was like 58 or 59 dollars. Yeah. Uh, mine was 57. Uh, and they had to get a credit report before I paid for it. <laughs> Jeez, you can get an eight ounce filet in oh, Dallas know. for almost that price. We, this is the same place I went in Austin. This was the Dallas version, but where I spent 152 or 158 on my family. And Marty was like, well, at least you fed your whole family. <laughs> said, well, that's true. <laughs> Randy didn't even. I mean, the thing that made me angry was it's a little bit like being a father. If your kids eat all the stuff that they buy, you don't have a whole lot of you, you really can't be terribly critical. That's right. But but my third son, Randy, he didn't eat. I mean, he barely touched that thing. He's like, oh, I'm so full. Yeah. <laughs> like, man, you could you could feed 10 people with that thing. Yeah. Well, we we wrote mine off because we used it for social media for take that's little, right. little tea. Tax, tax right off. You got that's it out a on veteran TikTok. move, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's somebody who's been in the, the – that's a man in the arena. You've been in the arena before, yeah. Dunaway. Now – I will tell you that mine was also expensed. <laughs> the, the best part of the experience, though, so I got the brisket sandwich, which was just just off the chain Me how too. delicious it was. Oh, so good. But after a couple bites, I had to 86 the bread because I knew I wouldn't get through the brisket if I kept eating the bread. So I just moved the bread to the side and went straight brisket. But did you have the corn? Did y'all get the corn? I didn't get the corn, no. I, I, Dude. I, I've, I've found macaroni and cheese late in life now. I didn't do macaroni and cheese until now, and I love the mac and cheese. I did not do the corn. What, was corn on the cob or was it street style? No, no, LT. It was like it was in a bucket, a little canister deal, and it was creamed corn, but it mm. had this super sweet finish to it mm. that almost had a – like a butterscotchish kind of Ooh, thing going on. That it was phenomenal. A, it was a very, a very unique experience, and scared the hell out of me if I'm being honest with you, because I said, "My God, if they can make corn taste like this, what's their <laughs> apple pie going to taste like?" <laughs> hey, let me ask you this: We were talking about Ryan Day yesterday, and you spent some time with Ryan Day. Love that man. Okay, well, this dude is 56 and eight, and we broke down his eight losses, and they're all like quality losses. And we've gotten to a point in society where it used to be what the record was against top 25 and then what the record was against top 10. And then I saw yesterday Ryan Day is one and six against top five teams. So we're shrinking it down. But I've seen pictures of Ryan Day where he didn't have bags under his eyes. He is so stressed out. And, and, and I don't know if you agree with this, but if this team was to go 10 and two to lose to Michigan, Michigan goes 10 and two and wins a Big 10. I don't know what the future is for Ryan Day. I think he's a hell of a coach, but I've never seen somebody with this much success be in a corner that he is in. Hadn't be, I mean, it's got to be Michigan. You got you, you got to beat Michigan. I would venture to say that beating Michigan this season is more important for him. 
in the overall scope of the perspective of the Ohio State fan base than winning the Natty. I think both of them are very important. If you look at the roster they've assembled, it's ridiculous. Their NIL numbers uh, are as high as anything in the country, and they've assembled just so that means a pro roster. A lot of guys came back, chose against entering the draft for, for multiple reasons, but one of them's money. And so, look, that quality losses, I don't even know that you know, in Columbus, Ohio, I don't know that that applies. I think that applies in a lot of places, but I just don't know that it applies there because the expectation is win, like beat Michigan, win the league, and at least contend for the Natty. And especially this year, Lance, especially this year, because it is all chips, man. It is all chips they got. So much talent at every position. So much depth at every position. Will Howard is arguably the most important player. Like, his performance might be the most important in the country for the overall prospects of that team this year. And you bring in Chip Kelly, a guy that, that Ryan Day not only admires, but I think he said at, at, at Big Ten, I trust him with my life. Guy knows offense at a very high level. Those two mesh very well. They've known each other forever and ever, amen. But it's now. The time is now for the Buckeyes. And I think if you just look at it on paper, most people expect them, okay, they'll beat Michigan this year. Will they? Who knows? Now that but, Nick, Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. It's just it's 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 an it's a vital vital year where the winning is the only thing. Now that Nick Saban's your colleague, you had a chance. Weird. You, you had a chance yeah. to spend some time with Kalen DeBoer. History of college football is riddled with guys who follow legends, and it doesn't work out. Why does this feel different for Kalen DeBoer? It feels real different to me. But I asked him. That was the first thing I asked him when he sat down with Ryan and me was that you, know, you never want to be the man who follows the man. What comes with that that we can't see? And the first thing that you have to do is you have to go in and establish your culture. You have to go in and say, this is my program. This is how we're going to do it. All that guy did was win. He's the greatest of all time. Great. But it's my team now. It's my program now. And if I mean, you guys know you're right in that. You're, you're around that all the time. Talking to friends of mine who worked under Saban and are now still in DeBoer's program, the energy walking in the door every day could not possibly be different, uh, more different. And it's just a different day. And I, what I can't wait to see is how does that staff continue to develop Jalen Milrow? Because I don't think Tommy Reese and his guys get enough credit for it. I think they did a freaking fantastic job last year Developing a young man that got benched, watched a game against South Florida, and then came back in, and my, this is my opinion, was a completely different player. You watch the Texas A&M game, he was throwing guys open in that game and then continued to use his legs to diagnose as the season went on. And what DeBoer and his guys do is they develop guys. They develop that position very well. So I look forward to seeing that maturation and evolution of Milrow in that role yeah it's a very different energy man and you, you know talking to that guy he doesn't seem urgent his intensity is I mean I, it's not to say he's not intense because that's not accurate but it's the it's it's a very different uh brand of intensity than they knew for 15 or 16 years with coach Marty Smith is with us from ESPN at Marty Smith ESPN on Twitter. He's on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. Speaking of your colleague, Nick Saban, did you and Ryan, uh, you, you did like a state of college football or future of college football deal with he and uh, Greg Sankey, right? Am I correct we, on that? We did. Yes, sir. That's going to air August 19th Okay. Um, on, on SEC Network, a 30-minute program. And I would argue there's no more – I, they, I could argue that those are the foremost experts on everything that's going on right now in, in college sports because Coach Saban lived it at, at, at the coach, head coach CEO level within 
a program that has the highest expectations. And Sankey, in my estimation, is the best leader in college sports. And it could be argued the best in sports. I mean, a guy just seems like he's playing chess all the time. He's very deliberate, very intentional, and very measured in the way that he leads. And I don't, I would love to hear y'all's perspective on this. I have yet to see a misstep. All the way back to COVID, let's just go back to the last four or five years. Other people said, we're not playing. Kevin Warren, we're not playing. The Pac 12, we're not playing. Sankey said, I'm taking my time. Ultimately, we're playing. And then everybody else went, Oh, bleep, they're playing. They're going to make all this money. They're going to name a national champion. We better play. And it's just continued throughout all of this evolution and transformation, whether that's conference realignment, he was at the forefront of that. Whether that is all that's coming right now with, with in Washington, he's at the forefront of that. And so, yeah, we sat down with those two. It was a fascinating conversation for both of us. Uh, I think in retrospect, I think if you ask both of them, they wish they'd sort of gone back and forth with one another a little more. Certainly McGee and I would have loved that, but they're really just getting to know one another in that way too. So ultimately, I think it will be very educational, at times really funny uh, for the for the viewer base, for the consumer base. We loved it. Marty, I know most people know, but for those that don't, you grew up going to Lane Stadium with your father, big Virginia Tech Hokie fan, and Brent Pry year one, three and eight. They start two and four last year, and they finish so strong. And I'm really high on the Hokies. 20 returning starters. They've got their punter, their kicker coming back. Most experienced team in college football coming back, at least on paper. Brent Price said yesterday at ACC Media Days, if we don't make the ACC championship game, it will be a disappointment. I think they're going to be really good. Where are you on the Hokies this year? Well, with all that talent coming back, I'm very high on them, and he has done such a fantastic job of reestablishing. It's, it's one of those programs. That, you know, that's what's beautiful about college football, college athletics in general, but college football – each little each each university has its own culture, its own tradition, its own expectation of what, how we're going to project ourselves, right? And man, has he reinstilled exactly what that is in Blacksburg, Virginia. Now I appreciate his optimism. It's gonna be damn hard to do that, really hard. They're gonna have to. I saw what he said yesterday. LTs. They are gonna have to coach their ass off. That's what he said. But they have a really good young quarterback. They have great pieces coming back. To your point, a lot of they have a lot of talent coming back uh, as starters. But do they have the depth? You don't just have to have the first wave now in college football. You have to have the second too, and they're still building that depth. So, my gosh, I hope he's right. I hope they're playing for an ACC championship. That would be wonderful. This quickly, I mean, I was wondering last year at this time, would they ever get back <laughs> to the glory days? Like, would they ever in in this college football where you're looking at FSU who has so much talent, you're looking at Clemson who has so much talent, but certainly could be argued has underachieved the last couple of years. And uh, there's some other teams in that conference who are pretty good, but man, I hope he's right. Not going to be easy, but I, I think the pieces are there to be in the argument. Uh, Chiefs second and Broadway T-shirt on. Uh, talking with Hugh Freeze at SEC Media Days, he, uh, I mean, Eric Church gave has given that coach so much confidence. He was telling me some stories along the way of he and Church, uh, as he calls him, Church, uh, just the uh, the uh, different points where he sort of lifted Hugh up. Uh, what what do you expect from Hugh year two down at Auburn? Uh, I have high expectations. He's a great football coach. I, I, you guys have probably asked him this, and I just look at it as a gift from above that this happened to hit me. It was not in my notes. I did not prepare it in our sit-down with Coach Freeze, but it hit me as he was talking because uh, I went back-to-back -back questions, which Ryan and I try very hard to have respect and deference for one another. Let's go back and forth. You guys probably battle this too at times. You ask a question of a guest 
instantly another one enters your mind. You want to jump right in and ask that follow-up. McGee and I try very hard to be respectful of one another and let that happen. But with Coach Freeze, I kind of drew, I kind of jumped in because they hit me back to back. First of all, what is the lasting impact on your life from fourth and thirty-one? Can't wait for y'all to hear that answer. You probably yeah. asked him that. Y'all <laughs> talked to him way more. Hey, than he I told had. us it wasn't even yeah. the worst worst loss he's it, ever it, had. It wasn't in the top three. <laughs> yeah, he he started reeling off all these heartbreaking losses he's had. Yep. All right. So then I wondered, you're now that now that Nick Saban is retired and you can speak freely without fear of it coming back to you in any kind of locker room material, et cetera. Coach Freeze is one of the few guys that actually understood how to consistently beat him, how to consistently be competitive and beat Nick Saban. What was the secret? Interesting. And so I love having those kinds of conversations. I'm not giving away what he said, but I love having those kinds of conversations because if you look at it, there just haven't been that many. And whether it was back at Ole Miss, um, he had the opportunity to do it last fall and, and fell victim to the grave digger. And that's honestly, like he will tell you, like that's coaching. But it's also – it's also seeing tendencies within players. It's seeing tendencies within defensive strategies that you sort of just let slide a little bit, and then it beats you that way. And so, like, I just think the guy's a great football coach. I mean, he Auburn's fortunate to get him. I have high expectations for him in a very hard league. Uh, schedule looks like hell on paper, but, like, I, I'm sorry – yeah, you know, I was asked by somebody else in an in interview, interview recently with the college football playoff and now doing away with divisions, do we have to rewrite what success is? What a successful season is? Yeah. Because, like, you, two teams will make it to the SEC championship. You, I mean, you can look at Vegas now. If you have 12 teams, I think it's fair to say that the SEC could look at 33% of that, potentially. Yeah. Well, what if you're not one of those teams and you're fifth on that board, but you win nine games or something and go to a big-time bowl? Like, is that a failure? It's like the old-school tie, Marty, before we had overtime. Yeah. It was a tie a win or a loss. It was a – It was kissing your sister, right? It was kissing your sisters, what my dad always said. It could be like winning the NIT, Marty. (laughs) Yeah, nobody wants to win the NIT. (laughs) Hey, before we let you – Before we let you roll, you interviewed all these coaches. I said at Media Days, to me, out of the 16, the most charismatic is Hugh Freeze. If you had to take the best personality out of the 16, who would it be for you? Um, I I really – I think Drinkwitz is hysterical. I mean, he just makes me laugh my ass off (laughs) all the time. And he has this – he has this way of – dropping little digs that you if you're not really on your a game if you had a margarita or two too many as i did last evening you might not have the mental clarity to pick up on on what he's really saying so he's an intelligent lane kiffin (laughs) well i think lane kiffin's intelligent i think he's really intelligent um my favorite interview from media days was lane kiffin because he openly told I said to him, look, I know you have a wonderful football team coming back. The expectations are very high and should be, but I care far less about that and far more about what I believe college football to be in its fabric, and that's fathers and sons and the generational impact of the experience of Saturday afternoons in the fall. And he looked at me, and because my question was, how do you even begin to envelop and describe and articulate your dad's influence on your life as man and professional and person and he said he didn't want to really talk about it well then he started talking about it and then he really started talking about it and by the end of the conversation he had genuinely had tears in his eyes and looked at us and said i did not intend to have this conversation today but i will be honest with you it was therapeutic thank you and I've said a lot on this show and elsewhere that you know you when you lose your dad as a man, especially that like a guy like that who 
watched the impact that his father had on so many people with a completely different personality than he has. You are reminded of the responsibility of the role. And it really crystallizes the daily walk that you have and the, and the steps and the journey that you're taking and how precious it is. But also, that responsibility is large. There's a lot of parents and there's a lot of mentors who have entrusted your wisdom you know, entrusted their children within that ecosystem. And so I just love that kind of conversation. And yeah, I, I really enjoy talking to that guy all the time, uh, whether he's trying to be funny or I was telling the story. One of the weirdest moments I've ever had was I went down there to do an uh, interview with Jackson Dart in Oxford last year. And Lane found out I was in town. He's like, hey, come down here and see me. I walk into his office after I got done with Dart. And Lane's like in some swimming trunks, <laughs> shirtless, with a towel around his neck, getting ready to go to some hot yoga class. <laughs> and I was like, man, I, I picked the wrong time to walk into your office, son. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Woody Hayes never did hot yoga. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Woody Hayes wasn't, wasn't in his, uh, in his skin. He's getting ready to go <laughs> do some. Downward dog. Uh, Marty, it is always <laughs> fun. We appreciate the time, my man. Love you, boys. I appreciate you. Be, beware of that beef rib, man. It'll get you, it'll get you in the belly and a wallet. <laughs> Three easy payments, though. Three easy payments. <laughs> See you, brother. Love you. Take care. See you, boys. Love y'all.